Now this is nice. It looks like we're back in a dining hall. But this must be the Sketchy U's VIP dining experience. Sunlight, city views, not a hungover freshman in sight. This is way better than the cinder block walls and soggy spaghetti across campus. They've even got a groovy stereo system, which reminds me, we're not just here for creme brulee. We're here to take on some advanced topics in stereo chemistry, like diastereomers, meso compounds, and fissure projections. Let's hit it. Ooh, now that's even better. This gal prefers to bring her own jams to the cafe. In fact, so much so that she's toting two stereos. You could say die stereos. That should remind you of diastereomers, which are any two stereoisomers that aren't enantiomers. Explains why this interloper from a rival school is rudely sporting a no ants shirt right on sketchy U's ants home turf. Remember, by the way, that enantiomers are two molecules that are non superimposable mirror images of each other. And that means any two stereoisomers that are not mirror images are diastereomers. So, how can two molecules be diastereomers? One common way for molecules to be diastereomers is symbolized by these signs by the diastereo gal, marking the in trans to the sizzling grill. Trans and cis isomers of otherwise identical molecules are diastereomers of each other. The light bulbs on different sides above the in trans sign should remind you that trans molecules have their highest priority groups on opposite sides of a plane from each other. Conversely, cis molecules have their highest priority groups on the same side of a plane, which explains the arrangement of the two bulbs on the cis-zole sign. But there's an even more common way that you'll encounter diastereomers, molecules that have multiple chiral centers. If two of these molecules have the exact same connectivity and some, but not all, of those chiral centers differ in their RS configurations, Voila! Diastereomers. Notice the writing on the diastereos. One is a stereo with an S and an R, and one is a stereo with two S's. Because if one molecule has, for example, S and R chiral centers, but the other has S and S chiral centers, assuming their connectivity is the same, these two molecules are diastereomers of each other. Remember that if all the stereocenters in two otherwise identical molecules are switched, for example, SS and RR, these molecules are enantiomers, not diastereomers. And finally, remember that the molecules need to have the same atoms and connectivity to be stereoisomers at all. For example, Two totally unrelated molecules that just happen to be SR and SS aren't diastereomers or enantiomers. They're just unrelated molecules. Speaking of multiple chiral centers, there's a special thing that can happen when a molecule has multiple chiral centers and happens to be very symmetrical. That molecule might be a meso compound. Meso compounds have multiple chiral centers symbolized by the multiple carrots, which are shaped like chiral center indicators. But what makes meso compounds special is that they have an internal mirror plane, symbolized by the chopsticks creating a line of symmetry in the soup. This means if it was possible to fold the molecule in half, the halves would match up perfectly. One interesting fact about meso compounds is that despite containing chiral centers, they are achiral molecules overall which you can remember by the fact that a spirited member of the a Cairo sorority left a sticker on the miso soup sign. This is because any molecule with an internal mirror plane can be superimposed on its mirror image, which by definition makes it a chiral. All right, now that we've hit some of the stereoisomer special cases, we're going to talk about a method for depicting molecules that makes it a little easier to identify stereoisomers and wrap your head around them. Anyone care for some seafood with their soup? This fish bar 
which may or may not lead to a raging norovirus outbreak on campus, is where we'll cover, you guessed it, fissure projections. A fissure projection is a way of viewing a three-dimensional molecule in a two-dimensional plane. The idea is that you imagine the molecule being flattened out, like this flounder, in a very particular way. As long as you keep the particular rules of the flattening process in mind, you can always convert a Fisher projection back into a more 3D looking image, like a dash wedge drawing. Here's how to create a Fisher projection. You start by viewing the molecule as if it were literally a fish, flopped over on its back, like these crawfish beauties on skewers. Make sure your molecule is oriented like a plus sign on the page. Then, the bonds on the vertical axis should be the ones like the tail and head of these belly-up fish, pointing away from you on dashes, much like how the crawfish's head and tail are vertical in this much friendlier and less realistic depiction on the 2D sign. The bonds on the horizontal axis should be coming out at you on wedge, sort of like how the little legs of these crawfish go up into the air but end up oriented vertically in the 2D sign. Next, you just turn the dashes and wedges into straight lines. Inherent in the Fisher projection is the idea that any bond on a vertical line is going away from you on a dash, and any bond on a horizontal line is coming out at you on a wedge. Compared to 3D depictions, Fisher projections can make categorizing stereoisomers much easier. Two enantiomers will have mirror image Fisher projections. Typically, that makes it so all the functional groups that appear on the left side of one molecule will appear on the right in the other. Two diastereomers will have fissure projections in which the configurations at some, but not all, of the stereocenters are inverted. So some functional groups will switch positions in the molecules, but others will be in the same places in both molecules. And finally, a meso compound will have an internal mirror plane in its fissure projection just like it would in a dash wedge drawing. Okay, fine, fine, you say, but what if I want to move my Fisher projection around? What happens to all that carefully encoded stereochemical information? Let's take a look at this delicious vat of tartar sauce to see. It turns out that if you rotate a Fisher projection by 90 degrees, or if you just swap any two groups in the Fisher projection, you'll end up inverting the chirality at all the stereocenters you rotated or swapped. So you'll be making the enantiomer. How does this relate to tartar sauce? Well, if you turn the handle on this tartar sauce dispenser by 90 degrees, you'll get a nauseating amount of condiment. But you also end up swapping tartar with sauce. So two S's become two R's, just like the chiral centers in a 90 degree Fisher projection rotation. If instead you rotate the Fisher projection by a full 180 degrees, that's just like doing two 90 degree rotations, a swap from R to S, and then another swap from S back to R. So rotating the Fisher projection by 180 degrees creates the same molecule you started with. And again, this works with a single chiral center or multiple chiral centers. Okay, as a uh, unique as this fish buffet is, I'm going to take a hard pass on the food poisoning drowned in tartar sauce. Luckily, there's just one more thing you need to understand if you're going to call yourself a master of stereochemistry. And that is the principle that, as this polite sign so aptly points out, when it comes to optical activity, there is no free lunch. You can't get optical activity out without putting optical activity in. What does this mean? It means that if you're going to form an optically active product, aka one that is both chiral and not a racemic mixture, you need to start with an optically active starting material or use an optically active reagent. If you don't, and all you use are optically inactive reagents, the product you get will be optically inactive. Sort of like how these two blindfolded fellas can't see well enough to remove each other's blindfolds and generate some optical activity. Keep in mind that this holds true even if the product formed is chiral. 
The way to be both chiral and optically inactive is to have a 50-50 racemic mixture of enantiomers. So, if you see a non-racemic chiral product formed in a reaction, you can be sure that there was some non-racemic chiral reagent involved in the formation of that product. And that is it for our delicious and nutritious tour of advanced topics in stereochemistry. Let's recap before all that tartar sauce gets to our heads. Diastereomers are any set of stereoisomers that are not enantiomers. This includes molecules with multiple stereocenters in which some centers are inverted and others are not. And it also includes cis and trans isomers. A meso compound is any compound that contains both multiple chiral centers and an internal mirror plane of symmetry. Meso compounds are always achiral. And Fisher projections can be used to visualize three dimensional compounds in 2D. You only need to remember that bonds on the vertical axis point away from you and bonds on the horizontal axis come towards you. Rotating a Fischer projection by 90 degrees creates its enantiomer, and rotating it by 180 degrees regenerates the same molecule. And finally, when it comes to optical activity, the blind really can't lead the blind. If all of your reagents are optically inactive, either because they are achiral or because they're racemic, your product will be too. Well, I think I've had just enough of the student dining experience for today. Off to drink some water, lie down, and never think about the words bulk tartar sauce again. <laughs>